Welcome to Rice University and the Department of Religion. My name is Bill Parsons, and today we continue with another installment of our Rockwell Lecture Series on Black Lives Matter. Today we are fortunate to have presentations from not one or two, but three outstanding scholars, Stephen Finley, Biko Mandela Gray, and Margarita Simon Guillory. Each speaker will deliver their lecture for about 30 minutes, give or take. At the end of their collective presentations, there will be a 30 minute question and answer period. You may ask your questions by using the Q&A button, which should be at the bottom of your screen. In so doing, please make sure you make explicit to whom the question is directed. All questions will be saved and answered after all of our scholars have finished. We begin with Professor Stephen Finley, Associate Professor in the Department of Religious Studies and the African and African American Studies Program at Louisiana State University. His ongoing research is in three primary areas, African American Latter-day Saints, Malcolm X and Gender, and African-American religion and esotericism. Professor Finley is the co-editor of two books, Esotericism in African-American Religious Experience and The Religion of White Rage, Religious Fervor, White Workers, and the Myth of Black Racial Progress, and is presently finishing a monograph titled In and Out of This World, Material and Extraterrestrial Bodies in the Nation of Islam. His talk today is titled, Make America Great Again, Racial Pathology, White Consolation, and Melancholia in Trump's America. Please join me in welcoming Professor Finley. <laughs> Thank you, it's, it's wonderful to be here. And, uh, and I just wanna say that I have uh, two monographs that are actually under contract with really good university presses in case Rice University ever wants to give me a job. And, um, and, a, and a third <laughs> that I think will be under contract very, very soon, also with a very good university press. Before I talk, Jonathan's going to uh, uh, play a very short video that I think is really helpful context for the, uh, uh, the, uh, the presentation. Jonathan, are you ready? make sure the sound is working on that. Can you figure out the sound, Jonathan? So Lisa, do you think you could help us? Um, Hold on, let me see for the enemy. Enemy. It's not on the there it is. Thank you. <laughs> what are you doing? Nothing. Finishing up. Have you handed in your resignation from the KKK? <laughs> Affirmative. Have you handed in your resignation from the Colorado Springs Police Department? Negative. Truth be told, Patrice, I always wanted to be a cop. And I'm still for the liberation of my people. My conscience won't let me sleep with the enemy. Enemy? No, I'm the black man that saved your life. You're absolutely right. Right. And I thank you for it, but I can't do this. I think we should, we should talk. It's okay, it's okay. I said it's okay.
had a group on one side that was bad, and you had a group on the other side that was also very violent. Nazis go home! Not all of those people were neo-Nazis, believe me. Not all of those people were white supremacists. But you also had people that were very fine people. Because I believe that today in Charlottesville, this is a first step toward making a realization of something that Trump alluded to earlier in the campaign, which is, this is the first step toward taking America back. Okay, Jonathan. All right, thank you very much. My presentation is called, again, Make America Great Again, Racial Pathology, White Consolidation, and Melancholia in Trump's America. The paper is and presentation is framed by three epigraphs. Uh, the first two are from Franz Fanon. The Negro is a phobogenic object, a stimulus to anxiety. And the second is, I came into the world imbued with the will to find a meaning in things, my spirit filled with the desire to attain the source of the world. And then I found that I was an object in the midst of other objects. And then finally, from Robert Hood, alternatively, why does blackness suggest sexual allure in spite of the feeling that it conveys something negative? My presentation is based upon my chapter in the religion of white rage, white workers, religious fervor, and the myth of black racial progress, co-edited by Biko Mandela Gray, Laura Latrice Martin, and myself. I was interested in an interpretation of whiteness in our contemporary moment, and I was intrigued by the matter of blackness and objectification within the spectrum of American whiteness. What is this phenomenon that leads to police brutality? Why does blackness occupy the bottom center of race relations in America? Why does whiteness consolidate during moments of perceived black racial progress or desire for progress? I was interested in the meaning of and function of this phrase, make America great again, that Trump used and which Reagan used before him and the responses to it, what I call white consolidation that is illustrated in the rise of white nationalists, white supremacists and militia groups, but is neither limited to conservative groups nor specific demographics, but has historically rallied all segments of white communities, including so-called liberals. White communities come together across differences to maintain their position as subjects around whom the meaning of America and its institutions revolve. What was this all about? And why were black people constituted and maintained as objects within the gaze of whiteness? These were vexing and perennial questions that grasped my attention. And I was usually not satisfied with the answers in extant scholarship at the intersection of philosophy of race, critical whiteness studies, and religious studies, particularly when it seemed that scholars, not all, but perhaps most, skipped right over the study of religion as having something important to say about the origins, meaning, and endurance of whiteness. More to the point, my scholarly disposition and my intuition told me that this was a grave error that religion is precisely the category that we want and need to reorient our thinking about whiteness in this age and beyond to make sense of it. To borrow a phrase which I've used before uh, from Jeffrey Kripal, I employed a psychoanalytically informed history of religions approach to unpack the issue of whiteness and the chapter builds on scholarship in the history of religions and psychoanalysis of race. James Perkinson, who is trained in the history of religions and describes his method as quote, a history of religions phenomenology, close quote, is one of the more important scholars in the history of religions for what I'm doing. Thus, I wanna read from my chapter here and from Perkinson's article, The Ghost in the Global Machine, White Violence, Indigenous Resistance and Race as Religiousness, where it seeks to give expression to a coherent notion of whiteness as religion and as religious. Perkinson articulates what he calls a profile of whiteness, which includes individual decisions, economic and political factors, affective moods, and cultural gendered and erotic modalities that culminate and interface with the world, garnering and accumulating benefits while enacting violence on the world. In my own words now, 
What is religious about the whiteness that Perkinson is describing is that it is an aggregated complex of individual and collective relations of power, corporate networks, institutions, affects, cosmologies, myths, representations, epistemies, politics, and economics that congeal in the meaning and status of the bodies of those who live, identify, and are perceived as white, which structure the world, experiences, and relations with, and to an extent of, others who are not perceived as white, which function as the organizing interface with the world. In short, whiteness organizes, makes sense of, and overdetermines reality. Franz Fanon represents another important aspect of, aspect of my method. Perhaps as my most significant interlocutor, Fanon and his black skin white masks offers both phenomenological and psychoanalytic insights, although I disagree with him to an extent at certain points, because it seems to me that it deserves scholarly intervention, and I'll return to this later as I um, uh, uh, read a, a, a chapter from, uh, an excerpt from my chapter later. I make two important points from Fanon's work as I interpret the religion of white rage. In the psychoanalytic vocabulary of Franz Fanon, which drew upon Freud, Lacan, Jung, Adler, and others, black bodies are phobogenic, that is, white culturally constituted objects whose place must be maintained to protect whiteness from its irrational fear of contamination and loss. They are perceived and experienced as bodies that elicit fear and rage. First, the religion of white rage is characterized by the fear, disavowal, and concealment of what is experienced as a homoerotic incur incursion of the black world into the white world in which it understands itself in the passive position. Fanon referred to this phobia as destructuration. What he intends here is the white desire and need to maintain the distinction between worlds. The whiteness needs the black, and I say the black, not black person or black human, for its own existential articulation of its world and for its maintenance. By destructuration, Fanon also had in mind the ways that the presence of blackness, of the black object indeed, threatened a particularly white cosmology and psychic structure that had as its center, ironically, and perhaps in contradiction, a black object. It is this apparent contradiction of desire and animus, of consumption and expurgation, and of danger and attraction that is a sine qua non of the religion of white rage. Another feature of destructuration for Fanon is that it is, it is experienced as homoerotic, perhaps conceptualized in the androcentric configurations of the Oedipal complex or a critique of them, Fanon in my estimation intimates that white men envy black men. Regarding this psychoanalytic notion of destructuration, I am interested in the homoerotic implications, which appear in, in sublimated configuration in often coded racialized patriotic art forms most clearly seen in 19th and 20th century patriotic anthems, pledges, and cinema, to be sure, and in masculinist militias and movements. Fanon contends that the Black is eclipsed in these fantasies and reduced to a racist imago, which are then, I argue, sublimated in contemporary white cultural forms. Second, whiteness is dependent upon the Black object and experiences anxiety and irrational fear of its loss. This is the function and meaning of white consolidation. That is to maintain black as object and to protect whiteness from potential transversals, transversals and presumed contamination and to ensure the centered endurance of whiteness as a complex. For this to be so, it needs the negative binary meanings that it ascribes to blackness. And whiteness does not exist outside of this relationship with blackness and the greater world of, of color. Accordingly, this object other is phobogenic for white people, which Fanon casts, following other psychoanalysts, as a neurosis, which is linked, in my own words, to a primary narcissistic object loss, in this case, a subjective insecurity due to the absence of the mother. I conceptualize mother here as the absence or loss of an atavistic conception of origins and belonging. In Freudian terms, then, this fixation with and need for the black object is both regressive and erotic. That is a reversion to an earlier stage in development in which it was psychically invested and bonded. 
which is to say there is substantial investment of libidinal energy, which would accompany any an object cathexis, the resolution of which has to be realized in order to move through the human development healthily. Instead, whiteness is connected to the black object. It's inability to emancipate blackness or itself from blackness because of the anxiety and irrational fear that accompanies the idea of losing its object and the meanings that it projects onto it out of which its own identity and world emerges means that whiteness exists in and is a state of melancholia. Melancholia prevails when one refuses to grieve, to release an object in one's investments, hence to engage in the process of de-idealization and decathexis. In the chapter, I elaborate on this melancholia and its connection to Eliade's myth of eternal return, since it seemed to me that the two are, are connected. I want, I want to note that the first section of my chapter is entitled, Something Old is New Again, Make America Great Again as a Call for White Consolidation and Mythic Return, which signals my interpretive move. Here's what I say in the chapter. Whiteness is melancholic, therefore pathological, because of a perpetual return to its myth of begin beginnings and its mythicized representation, the white worker, in times of perceived crisis and loss, loss of its symbols, culture, worldview, and the benefits therein. Thus, it desires to replace what it perceives as potentially lost with something new, the black object, the ultimate symbol of the colonial age and age of conquest and civilization. In America, this sense of beginnings is utterly and indissociably linked to the enslavement of African Americans and parenthetically, the displacement and genocide of Native Americans. Make America Great Again is therefore a melancholic trope, a cry for meaning, and a mythological att attempt to transverse time and space to reenact and reestablish an exemplary model of life for white people. In this case, the black object, in the case of the black object, whiteness refuses object relational substitution, a transitional object that might allow it to be something else something more developed and egalitarian. Instead, it hangs on to the black object, which it, which it dirties and sullies and drags. It is tethered to it. It needs it. The fantasy to which Make America Great Again points is in fact a myth of eternal return. The call is quintessentially white and religious as the atavistic enactment of an archaic ontology, which is characterized by a platonic structure in the attempt to render the mythic and the existential consonant. Some of you have heard, as above, so below. That's what I have mind here. In Freudian terms, it is a regression to an idealized state of existence of early childhood, a narcissism which arrests white communal development because of its resistance, passively or actively, to racial progress. Returning to Fanon, I articulate my primary disagreement with his interpretation of the black object, which I articulate in my second point, that whiteness is an irrational fear of the loss of the black object upon which it is dependent. Fanon denies that, that uh, uh, it is dependent upon blackness and I disagree with Fanon. Therefore, I offer my chapter as an extension of and an intervention into uh, Fanonian psychoanalysis. His argument that the black object is phobogenic, a stimulus to anxiety, would seem to imply that it is a necessary condition for the emergence and maintenance of whiteness. Finally, some would argue, as I, as I said to uh, uh, Dr. Parsons earlier, that the chapter was a perfect arrangement for object relations theoretical interpretation of whiteness as an even greater intervention into Fanonian uh, psychoanalysis, and they would be right. I do, however, signal that direction as several points in my paper. I'll move quickly to my conclusion in which I locate the black object within classical theory of religion and here I build on Charles H. Long's significations and insights from Biko Mandela Gray. I'll read my chapter, my conclusion, that is, which is entitled Black People as the Mysterium Tremendum et Fascinans of the Religion of Whiteness. A conclusion, the religion of rage, a conclusion. But before I do, I want Jonathan to, to play that second video and then I'll read my conclusion. Many of you have already seen these videos. 
But well, to me, it's important because I think January 6th was predicated and motivated by anti-blackness. Today, I will lay out just some of the evidence proving that we won this election and we won it by a landslide. This was not a close election. And after this, we're going to walk down and I'll be there with you. We're going to walk down. We're going to walk down to the Capitol. Yeah. Yeah. Let's take the Capitol. Take the Capitol. Take the Capitol. We are going to the Capitol, where our problems are. It's that direction. Everybody in! This way! This way! Tens of thousands of folks, they came in in duffel bags. Where the hell did they come from? So I hope Mike has the courage to do what he has to do. And we fight. We fight like hell. And if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. Walk down Pennsylvania Avenue. I love Pennsylvania Avenue. <laughs> and we're going to the Capitol. And we're going to try and give our Republicans, the weak ones, because the strong ones don't need any of our help, we're tr going to try and give them the kind of pride and boldness that they need to take back our country. <laughs> Majority Leader. We're debating a step that has never been taken in American history. <laughs> President Trump claims the election was stolen. The assertions range from specific local allegations to constitutional arguments sweeping conspiracy theories. But my colleagues, nothing before us proves illegality anywhere near the massive scale, the massive scale that would have tipped the entire election. Okay, Jonathan. 
Thank you. All right, here's my conclusion. And remember, my conclusion is, is uh, uh, by including that video, I'm arguing that, that uh, January 6, uh, 2021 was animated by anti-Blackness. Here's what I say. My chapter has con contended that whiteness constructs Black people as objects, which it needs for its own identity and existence. This whiteness then serves as a primary religious orientation. Whenever whiteness feels threatened, when it perceives the potential risk, even if this threat is not quantitative, not a quantitative or factual reality, that it might be decentered cosmologically and in the culture, thus relinquishing accumulation, whiteness consolidates, often across multiple indices of violence. This perceived threat, consolidation and repetition are structural aspects of the religion of white rage. Moreover, the structure always includes a narrative retrieval that cites the need for a return to a mythical space of white utopia. Make America Great Again is such a call to retrieve a myth of beginnings in service of its contemporary enactment in the world. In other words, this structure is one of ritual and myth. Then in the chapter, I, I interpret these phenomena using and extending a Fanonian psychoanalysis. My conclusions were about the nature of the black object upon which whiteness depends. First, for Fanon, the black object is experienced as an irrational fear of destructuration, which it reads as homoerotic. And I ask you to think about the white militaristic responses. And second, whiteness suffers an irrational fear at potential loss of the black object. That whiteness is ambivalent about the black object, which many writers, including Fanon, Robert Hood, Martin Luther King Jr. and James Perkinson noted, frames the thrust of my final observation. That is to say, the black object is regarded with attraction and repulsion, desire and disdain, hatred and allure, fear and fascination. And I wanna suggest that the same structure that appears, this is the same structure that appears in the classical theory of religion, namely that of Rudolf Otto. Otto argues in his classic, The Idea of the Holy, that religious experience is sui generis. That is, it is irreducible to any other category. It is a thing in and of itself. It is a state or condition that is wholly other from something other than the natural order. Because it is a non-rational, because it is non-rational, it cannot be defined. It can only be approximated through symbols or ideograms, which can only point the way to it, but can never capture it. Otto says, quote, it cannot be expressed by means of anything else just because it is so primary and elementary a datum in our psychical life and therefore only definable through itself, close quote. The primary datum of religious consciousness is this non-rational feeling of the numinous, which leads to annihilation of the self, quote, submerged and overwhelmed by its own nothingness in contrast to that which is supreme above all creatures, close quote. One feels only one's creatureliness, as the numinous is felt as an objective presence outside of the self. Otto argues that this feeling of the numinous, <coughs> this irreducible religious experience has a structure. In his words, mysterium tremendum et fascinans, fear and fascination, awfulness, terror, and attraction, the same psychic structure in which whiteness experiences the black object. I conclude with this final observation. Whereas in auto schema, the numinous, the irreducible datum of the religious is felt as an ob object outside of the self, which annihilates the self. We find in whiteness a metaphysical inversion of auto in which the materium tremendum et fascinans becomes the black object. Like the numinous, it is experienced as an objective reality external to it to itself. Whiteness needs the black object as a metaphysical principle though it is attempting to produce a metaphysics where it is the principle of being itself. The black object, which whiteness needs and upon which it is dependent, therefore becomes the source, perhaps the source, sui generis for the religious consciousness and the religious meanings of whiteness. I attempt to unpack the structure of whiteness as religious, as it appears in relation to the black object, which it creates and maintains. This is the thrust of Make America Great Again, racial pathology, white consolidation, and melancholia in Trump's America. And perhaps the question and answer period will allow us to fill in some of the gaps that appear in the chapter, which I could not adequately cover here.
And I look forward to hearing what my colleagues will offer and the question and answer that will follow. That's it. <laughs> It's on you, Dr. Park. Okay, so I, I'm not seeing myself on the screen. Oh, so. okay, all right. Here we go, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Finley, for that really sophisticated and deeply insightful presentation. Um, Want to remind our uh, viewers that there is a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and if you have any questions about this talk, you can put them through any time, and we'll come back to them uh, at the end of all the presentations. So next up is uh, Professor Biko Mandela Gray, Assistant Professor of Religion at Syracuse University. Um, Professor Gray's research and teaching focuses on the relationship between Blackness, religion, subjectivity, and ethics, particularly as it relates to social justice movements in the United States. He is co-editor, along with Professor Finley, of the aforementioned book titled Religion of White Rage, and his forthcoming monograph, Black Life Matter, is under contract with Duke University Press, and we all look forward to, to reading that. So um, his talk today is titled, Now It Is Always Now, Blackness, Time, and State-Sanctioned Violence. Please join me in welcoming Professor Gray. Okay, so I've, I guess I have to un unmute myself. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Parsons, for inviting us. And I, and I want to thank everyone at Rice. This is sort of an odd homecoming in, a, in the best way possible for me to be on the screen with two people who I deem family and with a teacher of mine who has helped me in very in, in many spoken and unspoken ways. I want to first, before I get started with my talk, just acknowledge um, as I'm here in Houston on leave, just acknowledge for those of us who are in Houston, just want to acknowledge that the crises that we this past week were wholly preventable and in many ways incredibly frustrating. And I hope that everyone um, who is in Houston right now has found some kind of solace, has found heat, has found water, has found uh, the kind of community and care um, that they need in the wake of what in my mind was a wholly preventable humanitarian crisis. And with that, I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I am not as sophisticated in psychoanalysis as my uh, older brother Finley is, nor am I as sophisticated in social theoretical work as my older sister Margarita is, but I am a, ph a, a philosopher of religion. And so we will start, um, we will try to tackle this thing from the philosophical perspective. This isn't the first time we've heard, I can't breathe. At this point, it has become a refrain. Daniel Pantaleo siphoned the phrase from Eric Garner 11 times in 2014. And six years later, Derek Chauvin would, nearly, would use nearly his entire body, a uh, body weight, to press the phrase out of George Floyd nearly 30 times. In the intervening years, the phrase has become both a rallying cry and a profound critique. Excuse me. I can't breathe has become a shorthand for state sanctioned violence. It is laid bare how the state can and will destroy black life in the name of public safety and public comfort. This repetition between 2014 and 2020 is crucial. It sets in motion a set of dynamics that are central to the American myth of perpetual progress. In 2014, politicians made claims to enact change and for good reason, 2014 was a hellish year for black people. In January, of, uh, in January of that year, Jordan Baker was killed right here in Houston by off-duty officer Juventino Castro, setting off a spate of, of popular state-sanctioned killings. On top of Baker and Garner, John Crawford III, III would be thoughtless and thoughtlessly and mercilessly gunned down in a Walmart in Ohio. Darren Wilson would shoot Michael Brown eight times in a street in, in Ferguson, Missouri. And Timothy Lohman would kill Tamir Rice two seconds after he arrived on the scene without any hesitation. There were protests. There were calls for change. The country would respond. Progress would be made. 
In the wake of these killings, millions, if not billions of dollars were spent on body cameras and implicit bias trainings. An entire industrial complex, we might call that the anti-racism industrial complex, would form in order to, quote, retrain officers to be less violent. Politicians would say Black lives matter at political debates. The national conversation was changing. Progress would be made, or so we were told. 2020 exposed the, the failures of all of this money, these trainings, and this rhetoric. For all of the overtures to racial and social justice, Black lives would still, in the end, not matter, or at least be mere matter available for manipulation and eradication. The intermittent years exposed this. 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, and 2019 did not statistically see a decline in police shootings. And multiple databases from the Washington Post to the Guardian would show that Black people are still far more likely to be killed by police than their white counterparts. Money had been spent. Trainings had been enacted. Streets were being painted and renamed we were told that progress was being made. And yet Black people kept dying. It seemed that the progress that was being made was only for those who killed Black people, the police. There were no statistical nor phenomenological declines in violence. The police kept on killing, except this time they did it with more expensive toys. So much for progress. If, as Charles Long tells us, the American notion of progress is a mythical and flawed interpretation of the country's history, then I want to think about the notion of progress in and through the philosophy of religion. And so here I'm going to take a brief break from my manuscript and just say this is the beginning. This is both an early draft of a, a journal article that I'm writing for political theology on time and blackness. And it is also um, the early, early versions of my second book on Toni Morrison, Religion and Ethics. And so you're going to get a little bit of that uh, throughout this talk. And so I'll return. What does it mean that progress can and will still leave blackness, black life, black lives for dead? How do we think of the repetitive, if not outright mimetic, relation between 2014 and 2020? How is it that in the midst of large and widespread calls for justice, an entire country cannot seem to make the important and necessary changes to stem the tide of Black death? In this talk, I want to suggest that the reason this is all the case is because America relies on a notion of progress that is problematic. In fact, I want to suggest that the American notion of progress is what I'm calling a temporal theodicy. To make it clear, it justifies that progress justifies the goodness of the state in and through the often lethal violence it enacts against Black people. Progress is temporal. In other words, the country's very notion of progress over time is founded, founded on the temporal entrapment of Blackness. Put more simply, the country moves forward because Blackness gets stuck in time. For Black people, 2014 and 2020 do not mirror one another. They are and always will be the same moment. Christina Sharp gives us a powerful way of thinking about temporal entrapment. She calls this kind of entrapment the residence time of the wake, quote unquote, which is, quote, a time in which everything is now, it is always now, unquote. Residence time finds its sharpest expression in the Atlantic Ocean, where Africans were thrown, where Africans thrown overboard died quickly, but, but still remain with us, with the sea. Their remains linger in the bottom of the Atlantic. They are still being consumed and reused. Quote, the atoms of those people who were thrown overboard were eaten. Organi organisms processed them, and those organisms were in turn eaten and processed. And the cycle continues, unquote. Taking us to the Atlantic, Sharp prompts us to sit with marine biology. But that line, everything is now, it is always now, pushes us to think, to sit with Toni Morrison's beloved, in which the titular character reflects upon her time in the hold of the slave ship. Beloved, the physical incarnation of a ghost that was killed by her mother, Setha, returns to Setha and tells a variant of her own story. 
But beloved is not merely the protagonist's chill, killed child. She is also the incarnation of a lineage of black women going back to the middle passage. Beloved's story is the story of the slave trade. And because her identity spans generations, her story cannot be told in properly grammatical, which is to say linear fashion. Beloved's story has no beginning nor ending. There is only, always, now. The now of the whole, the now of and in that place where disorientation is, is one's orientation, perhaps ultimately so. And yes, I'm relying on Charles Long when I say that. This disoriented orientation is so strong that for a while, Beloved gives up on grammar altogether in telling her story, expressing the destabilized and destabilizing disorientation to which she is given over. This is what she says. All of it is now. It is always now. There, is, there will never be a time when I am not crouching and watching others who are crouching too. I am always crouching. The man on my face is dead. His face is not mine. And if you have read Beloved, you will know there are no periods or commas in Beloved's prose. It is just a ramble, perhaps something like a stream of consciousness, something akin to what, what maybe Finley and, and Margarita might be able to articulate psychoanalytically. But I'm looking at the grammar. So all of it is now, it is always now, speaks to the fact that the hold of the ship is a time capsule. It traps those within its physical confinements to a living death, a death that is not an end, but only a perpetual desire for the end. If it is now, if it is always now, then that now announces a temporal entrapment, a purgatory of time, that does not even allow for one to die. Not properly anyway. Quote, it is hard to make yourself die forever, unquote, Beloved speaks. Beloved's now offers no solace, no salvation. It only produces perpetual suffocation, a long-standing and interminable, interminable desire to die, even when death cannot come. You all might think might feel like I'm speaking in abstractions at this moment because I've been talking about the now and speaking in this circular way, but let's bring it down to the concrete. Consider the phenomenology of I can't breathe. I can't breathe is an expression of beloved's now because it is the articulation of the resident's time in the wake. I want you all to consider this. Garner and Floyd uttered those three words as they were dying. They were saying, I can't breathe as they could not breathe. They claimed they were dying even as they were not yet fully dead. This suffocation was slow. It lasted, it endured. Garner struggled to breathe on the ground. Floyd called for his mother. We know not what they thought in that moment, but we can reasonably conclude that they desired for this suffocation to end. And just like the man on, on Beloved's neck who could, not die, who could die and she could not die forever, this, this suffocation didn't end, not right away anyway. The now, the now that is always now, doesn't even let you die. It remains, it holds. Beloved's now holds Black people in the hold. It places a chokehold on Blackness restricting its capacity for movement, life, and being. The now stunts the capacity to move forward. The now stops time. 2014 is 2020. It is now. It is all now. Always. There's something perverse about politicians kneeling for eight minutes and 46 seconds in kente cloth stoles as they deny people access to resources for life, for food, for health. And if you all don't remember this, we can talk about this in the Q&A, but many people remember that, that the Speaker of the House or the, the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, and a host of Democratic politicians showed up and kneeled for eight minutes and 46 seconds on the Capitol as a symbolic expression of their solidarity with Black folks, even as the Congress could not provide resources for people to stay in their homes or even find ways to live. There's something heinous about the kind of protest that would reduce, that would reduce a cry for life into a rallying cry for political gain. 
And yet that is, a, that is precisely what this anti-Black world demands. It is, in fact, what it requires for its sustenance. Those well-dressed knees kneeling at the Capitol, co covered in the latest wool blend or high-end stocking, announced that eight minutes, 46 seconds is more than the duration of one's death. It is also the time of progress. It is the time to which we might return only to get over to reform. Eight minutes and 46 seconds is a past that for many informs our present so that we may have what some might call a better future. What I'm trying to say is this, the now always makes way for others. We are enslaved, presidents take credit for emancipation. We are segregated and denied resources, presidents take credit for unification. We are killed, politicians kneel and make vows to reform. The progress that seems to unfold always, seem, always comes at the expense of Black life, to the point where after a while, it seems that this country requires Black social and physical death to found and fund its notions of progress. All the while, Blackness is suffocated, imprisoned, beaten, broken, killed, and siphoned for everything it is. Having been stuck in the now, Blackness, Black life, Black lives are the material, the matter, in and through which the United States fashions its notions of progress. Calvin Warren makes this clear. He calls the now that I've been talking about Black time, and he claims that, the, that it makes possible another kind of time, a time with which we are more familiar, the linear time of progress. He calls this metaphysical time. And what he's trying to point out here is that metaphysical time carves out moments in the now to make them events with a beginning and an end. I'll give you an example. Even though Sadia Hartman makes clear that we live in the quote, afterlives of slavery, unquote, the widespread discourse in American popular culture within the United States is that slavery ended in 1863 or for some 1865. And as, and as such, black people have or should have gotten over it. Such a move, of course, neglects the fact that we are imprisoned and killed at higher rates or that we are vaccinated at lower rates despite dying from COVID-19 at higher rates. Once slavery becomes an event, in other words, once metaphysical time gets a hold of slavery and turns it into a, a temporal object, it can be dismissed. And others can claim that our present realities have nothing to do with past ones. Although black, although black time, the now, exceeds and defies metaphysical time, quote unquote, it is nevertheless, quote, subjected to its logic. Without this violent subjection, we cannot know the event, unquote. We cannot know the event of slavery, of George Floyd's murder, without violence. We cannot know that slavery ended without having slavery as a horizon. We cannot know progress without recognizing the violence that prompts progress to emerge. And here's where I'm gonna transition over to the philosophy of religion side. This all feels theodician to me. And for those who are unaware, if you're not familiar with the term theodicy, basically it is a philosophical structure of reason. It, it, in, in its most crude or, or originary terms, it is a way to justify the goodness of God in the face of evil. But a long time ago, theodicy extended its, its scope, especially after Nietzsche claimed that God had died and that people um, had replaced him. And so theodicy no longer needs God. As Stephen Finley and I wrote a while back, quote, the state, function, the state can function as God, who as the ar ultimate arbiter of guilt or innocence, wields the near absolute power and authority to do imminent harm to Africana peoples. Philosopher Lewis Gordon is helpful here. Quote, even secular societies may have a theodician mode of rationalization, where the society itself or some system of treasured knowledge or value occupies the deific role, unquote. In the United States, America has taken on this deific role, sanctioning the death of Black people in order to sustain its innocence, its goodness. This is theodicy in action. America frames itself as good through the violence it enacts against Black life. And part of America's anti-Black theodicy is this notion of progress. 
a progress that happens in time and over time, a progress that can only occur through the unfolding of time. Warren alerted us to the dangers of linear time. He pointed out how linear time is anti-Black in its very structure. And what I want to add here is that this anti-Blackness is not simply the violence of slavery itself or the violence of, of state-sanctioned murders, but actually also the, the justification for this violence that occurs in its wake. And if you don't believe me, or Warren for that matter, then perhaps you'll believe now President Joe Biden, who as a presidential candidate siphoned all kinds of meaning from George Floyd's death. If you'll give me a second, I'll go ahead and share my screen and let you all see what's going down. And we are. You know, one of the most important conversations I've had this entire campaign it was, some, it was someone who was much too young to vote. I met with six-year-old Gianna Floyd the day before her daddy, George Floyd, was laid to rest. She's an incredibly brave little girl. And I'll never forget it. When I leaned down to speak to her, she looked in my eyes and she said, and I quote, Daddy changed the world. Daddy changed the world. Her words burrowed deep into my heart. Maybe George Floyd murder was a breaking point. Maybe George Floyd's murder was a breaking point. Maybe George Floyd's murder was a breaking point. The heinousness doesn't simply come from him siphoning the words of a grieving daughter. It comes from the Theodician structure that occurs within the context of his very speech. Perhaps you still cannot hear it. The whispered scapegoating, the Theodician reasoning that mutated a man's life into a purpose to change the world for the better. Biden reduces Floyd's death into an event with a beginning and an end. Eight minutes and 46 seconds marks the beginning and of the end of a man's life. And having made this into an event, Biden prompts us to get over this event by seeing it as an object, as a quote unquote breaking point. But the truth is, we don't know how long it took for Chauvin to carry out his lethal mandate. Eight minutes and 46 seconds is a fabrication, a siphoning, a breaking up of the now, because Chauvin wasn't marking time. He took his time. The casualness with which he kneeled stretched time out, slowed it down, turning seconds into eternities. To watch that video is to be in the now, which is why for many of us, viewing that video is unnecessary. Others view that video because previously they told themselves that they did not know or that they had forgotten about the now, but some of us know better. Chauvin wasn't marking time, he didn't have to, but Biden was. He turned a slow enduring death into an event made for the purpose of progress, what was once the lethal scene of a murder vilely and disgustingly taking his time has now become eight minutes and 46 seconds of national absolution. Progress happened. These politicians in their kente cloth stoles and their expensive suits were kneeling for their own salvation. They were kneeling before what we might call the metaphysical altar of American progress. In other words, Joe Biden and by proxy, the country needed Floyd to die in order to even think about progress, about justice. The country needed it in the 17th, 18th, 19th, 20th, and 21st centuries. It needed it in 2014, and it needed it again in 2020, and it needs it now. Now, it is always now. And I'm concluding here. For it to be always now, no past, no future, only now, only the now of life and death, only the now of lives lived in death, of lives punctuated by death. There is no distance between life and death for blackness. There is only immediacy. Now is all that rem remains. Blackness is now, it is only now. We live in now, 
we are now and now saves others. 2014 is 2020 and we cannot change that. And we're certainly not holding our breath for it. After all, others will withhold our breath anyway and they will do so to save themselves. But perhaps in this space of now, in this space of withheld breath, in the hold that is a chokehold and a hold of a ship, maybe what Blackness offers in the now, what Blackness might be, among other things, is an unworking and unthinking of linear time. Maybe the residence time of Blackness is not a fixed place, but a perpetual unsettling of the very categories that would fix Blackness make it into the ungendered, undone, unworked, and unthought thing that it founds, but cannot help but exceed. In other words, maybe Blackness helps us to get rid of the grammar in the same way that Beloved got rid of hers. Others are saved through our deaths. Progress is made because we die, but perhaps we never wanted salvation or progress. Perhaps now, even if it's always now, it is also fugitive. And perhaps salvation is not what we are after, but instead a fleeting, flying escape from the temporal atonement logic that can only live through the reduction of our lives to our deaths. This may not be salvation, and it may not be progress, but it is what we have. And for now, that will have to be enough. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Gray, for that very powerful and philosophically astute presentation. So now we move to our final presentation. As they say in scripture, the last shall be first. And it is by Professor Margarita Simon Guillory, Associate Professor of Religion at Boston University. Her research search interests include identity construction, in Africana esoteric religions, religion and technology, and social scientific approaches to religion. She's the author of Social and Spiritual Transformation in African American Spiritual Churches, published in 2017, and co editor with Professor Finley of the aforementioned Esotericism in African American Religious Experience. In addition to these works, she has published articles in several journals, the Journal of Gnostic Studies. Culture and Religion and Pastoral Psychology, just to name a few. Her current project, Africana Religion in the Digital Age, considers how African-Americans utilize the internet, social media, mobile applications, and gaming to forge new ways to express their religious identities. Her talk today is titled, The Devil's Work, Race, Rich Witchcraft, and the Dem Demonization of the Black Lives Matter Movement. Please welcome me in, in uh, welcoming Professor Guillory. Good afternoon, everyone. Good evening. Um, first, I want to say thank you, Dr. Parsons, for the wonderful introduction. And thank you to the department for this invitation. And lastly, it's, it's always an honor to share space with my brothers here. Um, wow, your papers were phenomenal, but I didn't expect anything else. Um, so I would like to begin this talk with the words of Patrice Colors, and I'm going to say her last name a lot, and I have this Southern Alabama sort of twain going, um, so excuse me. <laughs> One of the co-founders of the Black Lives Matter movement, she states, quote, white supremacy makes us not just erase ourselves and who we are, but makes us erase what we are supposed to honor. And what more do we want to honor than the people that gave us our path in the first place? Why would we not want, why would we not honor the people who have been stolen from us? and asking from us to fight for them. We should be honoring them in all the ways, whether it be protesting through art, through putting signs on the freeways. They want us to remember them because they know what it takes for them 
to be remembered. These are the very words that Color shared with Dr. Melina Abdullah during an interview sponsored by the Fowler Museum. In this excerpt, Colors recognizes a dichotomy between forgetting and remembering. Colors establishes a direct correlation between historical forgetting and white supremacy. While at the same time, Colors purports that it is the responsibility of the living to honor those lives that have been stolen from us. These are explicit observations though. Embedded in this quote is something more explicit, implicit. Namely, color subtly reveals an intimate interconnection between those tangible bodies who are charged with the duty to remember and intangible bodies who direct these acts of remembrance for according to colors, quote, they know what it takes for them to be remembered, end quote. Immediately after talking about forgetting and remembrance, Colors begins to speak specifically about the hashtag Black Lives Matter in this same interview. This hashtag in particular, along with others that are associated with the movement are not just hashtags in and of themselves. Instead, for Colors, hashtags, quote, literally are all almost resurrecting spirits so they can work through us to get the work that needs to be done, done, end quote. Beyond this utilization of hashtags in evocatory ways, Black Lives Matter, Lives Matters activists also integrate other forms of ritual practices into their demonstrations, calling the names of stolen lives, say his name, say her name, pouring libations at various sites where people of African descent have been killed as a result of state-sanctioned violence, burning candles and incense, and are dedicating beloved objects to those who are being remembered. These are just some of the ritual practices that have been woven into the political fabric of the movement. The operative engagement of rituals of invocation, veneration, and remembrance then are an integral part of the movement. And in this way, Black Lives Matter, while it is a socio-political movement centered on the ascertainment of freedom, liberation, and justice, it is also Again, using colors words, colors, um, colors words here, it is a spiritual movement. I would like to repeat these words one more time. Black Lives Matter is a spiritual movement. So why the repetition here? It is this spiritual element of the Black Lives Matter movement that becomes a catalyst or a driving force, if you will, for the correlation between the movement and witchcraft. The movement, particularly as discussed on a variety of social media platforms like YouTube, is considered to be an outlet for diabolical witchcraft practices. I can't make this up, you guys. The co-founders of the movement, Alicia Garza, Patrice Colors, and Opel, T Opel, Opel Tometi, are labeled as witches who are using the Black Lives Matter movement to do the devil's work. Demonization of this type, as will be shown in the remainder of this talk, is nothing new. But the digital transmission of this type of thinking is indeed new. Before providing actual examples of this type of digital demonization, it is vital to take a look, even if for just a brief moment, at the ways in which Black women in particular were demonized for practicing various modes of conjure. Here conjure defined, conjure is defined, sorry, here conjure defined as the indirect and direct manipulation of materiality via ritual performance to achieve a desired outcome. 
Specifically, this mode of demonization was filtered through the actual racialization of witchcraft in the United States. During the 1870s and the 1800s, the racialization of witchcraft continued to appear intermittently in nationally known newspapers such as the Boston Daily Globe and the Washington Post. Generally, this coverage included descriptions of various ritual practices of witch doctors. More importantly though, interested reporters were preoccupied with explaining the origin of these practices. Several articles, for instance, published in the Boston Daily Globe between 1879 and 1884 touched on this matter of origin. One such article appeared in an 1879 issue of this paper, the article Voodooism, a conjure do doctor of the present, opened with the following sentence, quote, the only purely African trait which the Negro of this country possesses is his intense superstition, which is shown more particularly in his belief of witchcraft in general and the devil in particular, end quote. Here, not only is voodoo and witchcraft presented as interchangeable systems, a matter worthy of its own analysis, but these conjuring practices are posited as an inheritable trait of black people, black women in particular, as highlighted in this piece. Furthermore, this trait concretizes in witchcraft practices and these practices in turn are seen in relationship to the devil. Racialization of witchcraft also occurred more implicitly in periodicals during the late 1800s specifically those writing about witchcraft practice among African-Americans made a clear distinction between Negro forms, as one writer puts it, and European derived witchcraft. People of African descent who practiced the craft were deemed to have little in common with the witch of storybooks. They never ride broomsticks or resort to the thousand and one petty arts of the Saxon or this, or this um, Celtic, um, Celtic witch. Theirs is far deeper, is a far deeper and deadlier form of sorcery. While witchcraft may be present in African-American and white communities, it is seen as more diabolical in the former community than the latter. This mode of differentiation, while it acknowledges a small degree of commonality, further solidifies connections between race and witchcraft. African-derived witchcraft was different. And as a result, it was quite often used interchangeably with terms like Obi, Voodooism, and Conjure in articles published in journals during the late 1800s. Conflations of this type flattened complexities of Africana conjuring traditions like Obia, Voodoo with the O-U, and Voodoo with the double O's, respectfully. These traditions are traditions that are cosmologically rich, not just hideous forms of superstition or witchcraft. Presenting them simply as witchcraft ignores intricacies of these Africana traditions. Even more, because witchcraft, particularly as written about during this time, is seen as a practice of superstition with malicious intent, these traditions in particular and other conjure-based traditions are presented to readers as black art, sorcery, and abominable acts of evil. From the turn of the century through the mid 1900s, the racialization of witchcraft continued, primarily in scholarly discourse. Ethnographic based books like Drums and Shadows and articles like the Negro Witch Stories on Tape attempt to counter reductionistic views of racialized depictions of witchcraft. Witchcraft was presented as a mode of conjure used in both constructive and deconstructive ways by some Blacks generally and Black women in particular. On the one hand, it creates opportunities of equality, justice, and wholeness. Conjure secures fortunes, 
fixes enemies and heals bodies respectively. On the other hand, witchcraft or conjure possesses destructive properties. Quite often this destructive nature was discussed in correlation with the witch's power to shape shift. In their alternate forms, these witches were supposedly able to move throughout neighborhoods and homes without being detected. Consequently, this movement yield dire result consequences in the form of broken relationships, illnesses, psychical disruptions, and even death. In one article in particular, interviewees maintained that destructive activities of this type was the work of, quote, unnatural women, end quote. These unnatural women were Black women who were thought to have sold their souls to the devil. And in this way, according to an interview, uh, interviewee in the Negro Witch Stories on Tape, article that was just previously mentioned, these Black women were instruments of the devil, the devil here being understood as an orchestrator of witchcraft. So despite discussions of the therapeutic activities of these witches, Black women who practiced various forms of conjure were overwhelmingly defined as malicious actors whose primary goal was to gain access to and power over their victims and bring about harm to them. This correlation between the conjuring actions of Black women, notions of evil and domination still operates, not necessarily in newspapers and periodical accounts, but in the form of social media outlets like that of YouTube. So just to stick a pin here, I was thinking about brother Dr. Biko's work when he was talking about progression. You would think, okay, these are periodical articles from the 1800s, 20th century, but we see in social media, these same sort of understandings being propagated in digital form. Let's now turn our attention to YouTube and consider the way, yes, good old YouTube, and consider the way in which this digital platform is being used to further propagate interconnections between Black women, witchcraft, and doctrines of evil. A brief analysis of three videos is offered if we have time here. The first video was uploaded on August 19, 2020. It is actually the audiovisual portion of a popular podcast among evangelicals called the Hamilton Corner. Abraham Hamilton, who is the host of this podcast um, and self-identifies as a Christian, starts the episode by thanking his producer, who by the way is a, is a white man, for bringing the topic of discussion to his attention. He then moves to address the subject at hand which is the Black Lives Movement connection to witchcraft. He is structurally strategic in the way in which he unpacks his argument and that he plays sound bites from Culler's interview with Dr. Um, Abdullah and then uses her words to draw the correlation between the Black Lives Matter movement and witchcraft. Specifically, Hamilton focuses on the invocation of spirits that Colors discusses in the interview and that we, had a, that we had a preview of in the introduction of this talk. He then connects this spiritual invocation to Ifa divination. And Ifa divination is, this cos is a cosmologically rich West African um, system of divination. But he doesn't see the tradition in this, in this way. He states, quote, one of the touchstones of this religious practice, he's talking about if a divination, is ancestral worship. Guess what, folks? Guess what, folks? The Bible calls that witchcraft. And these orishas and, and the ancestors that they are calling for are demonic spirits, end quote. In this way, this ancient African divinatory tradition is reduced to a demonic form of witchcraft. A further reduction occurs when he equates the practice of 
spirit invocation um, in, at Black Lives Matter rallies to Marxist forms of pagan um, 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 Satanism. The Black Lives Matter movement is then, in his words, an organization for spirit wickedness, and that its leaders, in particular, are both trained Marxists and wicked witches who, will who are helping to advance the cause of Satan. Before taking callers, which can be another talk in and of itself, the discourse between him and his callers, he tells the listening and viewer or the viewing audience not to be mad at him for speaking the truth because he's just telling it like a T.I. is. For those from the South or you have relatives from the South, you know what that means. One week later, a second video was uploaded to YouTube entitled Black Lives Matter, Witchcraft and Communism, What You Need to Know. The accompanying description is also worth noting. It reads, quote, documented contextual evidences from Harvard Law Review, video interviews of founders and more. This is not a conspiracy. We can support black lives and racial justice, but this is my favorite part of the description, by the way, but avoid this Trojan horse, end quote. Both the video's title and description are quite telling. Again, a correlation is being established between the movement and witchcraft. This correlation will be supported by facts, not just opinions espoused by some random YouTuber. In this video, Josh Atkins, a white man who self-identifies as a Christian, provides viewers with three reasons why they should not support the Black Lives Matter movement. The first is that the movement promotes Marxism. Interestingly, he splices in multiple interviews of Angela Davis as material to build the case that Black Lives Matter is a Trojan horse for Marxism. Secondly, he maintains that the movement is a concretized form of immortality explicitly highlighting the sexual orientation of the movement's founders. Lastly, he warns people not to support the movement because its leaders and followers practice witchcraft. Similar to Hamilton's video, Atkins show clips of Dr. Abdullah's interview with Colors. Particularly, he focuses on the portion of the interview where she talks about ancestral remembering or remembering rituals of remembrance. Furthermore, he shows clips of Hamilton's podcast to maintain that this movement is seeking to instigate social controls through the summoning of the dead. For him, this is the work of the devil. He states, quote, when you practice witchcraft, you are operating for the wrong team. You are under the influence of a demonic force. Ultimately, I mean, end quote, ultimately nothing is being inferred here. Atkins argues that the Black Lives Matter movement is a Trojan horse concealing a devious intent to interject Marxism sexual deviance and witchcraft into society. Moreover, the builders of this horse are three black women. For the sake of time, the analysis of the last video will be a bit shorter. However, I will be delighted to share more details about it during the Q&A session. This video was uploaded to YouTube the following week after Atkins video. Interestingly, both the host Nissy T and her guests both self-identify as Black British Christians. So this narrative has now crossed over. After discussing the arrest of pregnant women in Australia for Facebook posts and discussing the hypocritical actions of Nancy Pelosi's salon visit during the, the during um, the global a global pandemic, they turned their attention to Black Lives Matter. 
Nizzy T makes the following declaration, quote, Black Lives Matter is witchcraft and we have proof, end quote. Like the previous two videos um, discussed, this video employs a particular, a, a portion of Dr. Abdullah's interview, you should see a pattern here, with callers discussing the role of ancestral veneration in the political activities of the Black Lives Matter movement as proof text to support the claim that at the heart of the movement is witchcraft. Unlike the previous two videos though, Nissy T plays a portion of the interview view where Colors talks about how hashtags are employed as in her words, resurrection tools. Hashtags are not just hashtags, but are employed to tap into the spiritual realm so that activists can receive the strength and guidance to do the work. This hashtag usage specifically maintains that behind the hash, I'm sorry, this hashtag usage drives the remainder of the conversation between Nissy T and her guest co-host. The latter, the guest co-host, specifically maintains that, quote, behind the hashtag is a spirit of witchcraft, end quote. Accordingly, these witchcraft practices are demonic and that they cause chaos and division. The Black Lives Matter hashtag then is a device of the devil. Taken together, what we see is the use of a digital platform to promote a racialized form of witchcraft that can be traced back to popular and scholarly treatments of conjuring practices in Black communities. Furthermore, these videos utilizing witchcraft as an interpretive lens formulates an image of the movement as a satanic form of witchcraft and its leaders who are black women as Marxist witches, instruments of the devil who are armed with malicious intent. intent. Interestingly, black witches are using YouTube to counter these demonic depictions. And I'm, I'm rounding out, I'm on the last lap because I know we need to get to Q and A. Hundreds of videos have been uploaded by Black women who self-identify as witches. And many of these videos precede this discussion that we just sort of saw having in um, 2020. Many of them offer rich depictions of witchcraft that are informed by positive ideologies of Blackness. For them, witchcraft is not a phase, a psychological state, or solely a feminist response to patriarchy, nor is it a tool for the devil. For black witches, the craft is an outlet that oppress people uh, that oppress people employ to oppose various modes of social marginalization that are fueled by racism, sexism, and homophobia. Thus witchcraft as practiced by oppressed people like black women is about assuring personal and collective survival quite often accomplished through the reclamation of ancestral traditions. All of these functions culminate in the, exer in the exertion of power, one that, racist sti one that resists stigma while apprehending a greater sense of self. Ultimately, Black witches assert that it is through their practices, which includes ancestral veneration, that they are able to resist, to survive, to reclaim, and to end power. These functions closely align with the instrumental role that ancestral remembrance, whether through ritual practice or hashtag usage, plays in the socio-political activities of the Black Lives Matter movement. What follows is just one example of how Black witches are employing digital platforms like YouTube, YouTube to align themselves with the movement while simultaneously espousing a dynamic form of witchcraft that counters demonic depictions of Black women who choose who choose to use conjure as a means to protest multivariant forms of oppression. 
On September the 15th, 2014, and that date should, should ring, ring to you. Three members of a digital coven known as the Black Witch Chronicles uploaded a video entitled Ferguson, The Black Witch and Beyond. This video, a direct response to the killing of Michael Brown on August 9th, 9, 2014 by a police officer, is a discussion among co coven members about the state of the civil rights movement, primarily as it relates to the Black Lives Matter movement. It begins with a tarot reading, each which pulled three cards. Here, the virtual space of YouTube became ritual space. Bondage, crisis, energy, healing, and work are just some of the themes associated with this digital tarot reading. For almost 20 minutes, these witches of color talked about the pain of being Black in this country, what resistance to continuous racial injustice needs to look like, and the role of Black witches in the civil rights movement. Specifically, Dr. G. Love maintains that Black witches must tap into the energy of ancestors like Harriet Tubman, for they, quote, work in the spiritual realm and political realm for freedom, end quote, utilizing magical practices to connect to ancestral modes of power is important for Black witches because it is this power that gives them the strength to do the work of fighting social injustices like that of police brutality in this country. This employment of ancestral veneration to do the work echoes the words of color shared at the beginning of this talk. Moreover, Black witches not only use YouTube, but other social media outlets like Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok to talk back, to talk back to those that equate their practices, ones that draw from the wellspring of African-derived religiosities to devil work, devil's work. Instead, they are conjurers root workers, hoodoo saints, activists, who are using the knowledge of African thought, Africana spiritual practice, divination, ancestral veneration, and healing, African healing modalities to heal, to protest, to fortify themselves, their elders, their peers, and the next generation of children to be. Thank you. Oh, there we go. Okay. Okay, uh, this is Jonathan Delavan. I'm going to be Jonathan. the moderator for our panelists as we discuss the various questions that are being proposed to our three wonderful panelists here. And let me start by saying thank you, each and every one of you for speaking today. You each had unique perspectives on this very pertinent issue for our times. And so I thank you for providing the insights and the perspectives you've had to share. Uh, for our first question, I would like to start off with something Dr. Parsons asked to both Biko and Stephen, where he <laughs> says, nowness in progress, frame psychologically, can be thought of as moving from primary narcissism, where the now and eternity predominate, to more mature psychological structures, where linear time and recognition of the other as other predominate. If one sees Stephen's talk as about narcissism and narcissistic rage, where the other is not other, but part of the self and so treated as such, how does that intersect with Biko's insight into the lack of progress and the now? 
Is it the glue holding both together? Nowness, rage, lack of progress, found in the lack of mature psychological structures of these of those in power. That's on you, boss. <laughs> <laughs> it's on you. You muted. I, I was gonna put it on you and say. <laughs> so, so I thought the three of us were gonna be bringing the heat since we're at Rice, and here's here's Bill bringing the heat in the questions, <laughs> and and that's gonna take some time for me to think about. Um, uh, Bill, Bill, could you have a, a bit of a rejoinder and unpack unpack that a little bit for us so that we might respond to it? Yes, I'd be happy to. Um, but when when you kept talking about how uh, for uh, certain segments of white people that black people are objects and they need to keep them as objects in, in, in main part to sustain a sort of a level of their identity. So they become, as it were, a social repository for all their anxieties and for their lack of ability to mourn which in Freudian terms, you know, mourning is part of growing up. It's part of maturing, right? They never did that. So they are basically fixated at a very immature, very primitive psychological level of development. So, mm -hmm. uh, so, so narcissism in some sense, there's no time in early primary narcissism. One stands still, it's always kind of a now moment. But if your psychological configurations are always, are always stuck there, so to speak, you can never talk about progress. You can never talk about linear development. You can never talk about maturing in some sense because you're stuck there. So when you look at you know, uh, what happened to George Floyd, I mean, the, the sadism that was going on, I mean, you know, that's just narcissistic rage, it seems to me. And it was kind of a timeless moment. It, he was stuck in that position, He's never able to grow. So my concern is, you know, with, with psychoanalytic theory, part of it is about social structure. Apply psychoanalytic theories, you have to change social structure, right? Mm -hmm. Racist social structure. But part is also about enabling a person to grow, to transform. They go hand in hand. They should go hand in hand. But they often do not. In the sense of we've never gone anywhere, that there's no progress, it seems to me it's because the level of psychological primitivity is so deep. It's so deep. And it's so it, it, it's not transformed at all that we keep getting this repetition over and over and over again. And psychoanalysis is really all about spiraling out yeah. of that infantilism, right? It's spiraling yeah. out of it. And so it seems to me that, that when Biko's talking philosophically about now, yeah. and Steve is talking about monarchistic rage, there seems to be a fit there. I agree. I have another question for Margarita, which also is sure. slightly different. Sure. So, so thank you for, for um, reading me that closely because you precisely articulated my argument here. Whiteness is stuck. Um, and, and as I heard Biko, this is my first time hearing this presentation from Biko. I, I did hear some of that overlap and some others that, that I'm gonna wanna talk to Biko about later. And that's precisely what, what I think I'm arguing is that whiteness is stuck. I think, I think what I wanna say here and also to the person who, uh, had to uh, uh, put the question in uh, the chat for Biko and then took off, is that I don't, I don't see uh, the left and the right as so distinct maybe as Biko does. I see them as much more closely related. And I'm gonna be, um, uh, I'm gonna take license here and say that I think in part what, what, what I would infer from what Biko said is sort of an Afro-pessimistic interpretations and say that the structures currently constituted don't allow for that kind of uh, what you call transformation. That, that what we need here is totally new structures, meaning a new world, right? And so I heard that too, and what you just said was, was brilliant and that's precisely what I'm arguing. Um, but I'm gonna be, again, Afro-pessimistic here and say that the current structures won't allow that. Yeah, and I'll and I'll just I'll just hop in here really briefly. I think I think Bill, you're 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 naming it pretty well. You know, I, I my 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 take here has everything to do with just the, the temporal side of this. And in many ways, if you all are looking at this as primary and narciss narcissistic rage, I'm looking at that narcissistic the violence of that narcissistic rage as being temporally displaced onto blackness. Right. So mm -hmm. if white if white subjects are stuck 
in this modality of primary narcissism, they also don't want to bear the unbearable disposition of being in that particular place. And so the violence, and I'm not a psychoanalytic person, I'm thinking about this philosophically, they want to displace this stuckness onto Black folks. And so what happens ultimately is, is Black people, 2014 does become 2020. And what also happens is the production of a certain kind of mythical structure happens on the backside, such that on the one hand, while this subject is narcissistically stuck, it will tell itself, I'm growing up, I'm getting better. This is what the country tells itself as a as a sort of national myth. And what I'm one and what I'm trying to point out here is, is that if we if we've made progress it strikes me that two people separated by six years could utter the same exact phrase on camera and we're still having conversations about what to do with police officers. That for me raises critical questions about number one, the nature of American myth-making, but also number two, questions about what we might call the existential displacement of one's death onto black folks, which is a structure that has been here since the Middle Passage, right? This, this is just kind of how things have, have operated uh, since we got here. And so that's the way that I'm sort of thinking through it is, is from that from that sort of like temporal, that temporal side of things. But I think you're absolutely right. I do think that there could be ways, I'll say this, I do think that there could be ways um, for, for white subjects, for the, for the nation as a subject unto itself to move past this. But that maturity would require, as, as Finley, Finley talks about, a fundamental restructuring of what it means to have justice, a fundamental restructuring of what law is, a fundamental restructuring of what constitutes law, lawfulness and lawlessness. And at this point, we don't have that, we don't have that structure in place. Uh, can I say one brief <laughs> other thing? I know there are other questions. Jeff and Claire have questions, so I don't want to take up too much time. But just briefly, I just want to make an observation about what uh, Margarita was saying, because I think it fits into here about notion of sort of psychological primitivity. And I've always been of the view that people, a, a large portion of the people who use Christian concepts, they're really dualists, right? They're like the early Augustine. They're not the Neoplatonic Augustine, they're the Manichaean Augustine. Yep. Yep. So it's always good and evil. So metaphysically, they're actually dualists, which is a heresy, but that's what they really are. <laughs> if you're a metaphysical dualist, then sociologically speaking, you're going to be a cop, right? Because you're on the side of the good and you have to repress the bad. You can be a doctor or a garbage man or, or a waiter, whatever, but you're you're always good if you're blogging or whatever, you're going to be a cop. And I see this all the time on my on my various blogs that, that metaphysical dualists have to be cops. Well, if you're a metaphysical dualist and you're sociologically a cop, then psychologically, you're going to favor two defense mechanisms, splitting good and evil, and projection. Mm -hmm. So they fit, there's a, it's like a cage, it's like a prison, but it's a psychologically primitive prison. But it's again, as, as Biko and Steve are pointing out, it's endlessly repeated over, I mean, just look over the last two yeah. times, over and over again. And it shows up the primitivity of the species, the human species, the yeah. way we operate. And at some point, you know, can we ever get out of that? I, I don't know the answer to that question, but right. it seems to me that there is, in all three of your talks, this kind of developmental infrastructure yeah. is animating these 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 problems. And Bill, before uh, Margarita replies, that's that's where I think I was trying to work with Eliade to make some sense of that. Right. Yeah. Right. Yes. Uh, brilliant. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, the other thing I'd like to say is that because I see whiteness as so dependent upon this black object, to me, the, the issue here really is, is whiteness. And what if, if anything is beyond whiteness? And I see that uh, in a sense as an existential crisis. Yeah. Like, like, like would people really give up whiteness and the benefits? And that's why I'm really pessimistic actually, and that's why we continue to see this uh, uh, ritual and myth, this repetition that, that we're talking about here. And right. I'll, I'll have something to say after Margarita goes. Go ahead, fam. No, this is, this is um, just very quickly. Um, I, I think for me, it's, it's the same old, same old, yeah. utilizing different outlets. Yeah. I just, I found it very disturbing that, you know, 
these three black women um, have been demonized for adopting Africana religious traditions yes. and implementing them because they can, right? <laughs> implementing them in, so, in a socio-political movement. And the fact that, you know, doing the history on this, you know, and I, I have read so many papers to see this same impulse that was in the early historical literature to continue to see it propagated in 2020, 21 even, if you look at YouTube currently, to see it propagated is very disturbing. And it's disturbing because there are real life circumstances that are attached when you begin to project this upon Black women. They're real life consequences. So as I looked at the video, particularly the, the video um, that both of my brothers shared, you know, I'm just thinking about the concrete, real life, how this sort of operates in the real life experiences of Black women in particular, that they are being seen, seen as devils, demonic, right? because they are political activists. It's almost as if this became, as soon, and she actually said in this interview, I think I'm, I might be saying too much. It's like she already knew that as soon as she started to talk about the importance of spirit practices, and, and, she, and she, it's almost, almost like she saw it. As soon as I say that this is a spiritual movement, it's over. And all of these, you know, just the three that I chose, people pulled from that interview. And they used what she said as a catalyst to drive home the same, the same old narrative. Black women are, are sexually devious. They are evil, they're malicious, they're demonic, they're witches, right? Um, so it's the same old, same old, just the new format. And and, I'll, and I, if I can just hop in here and, and piggyback off both Finley and, and Margarita, um, a couple of things. And Margarita, what you just said just really resonates with my notion of progress as a temporal theodicy, right? Because what's happening on the other side of this is if Black women are understood as witches, as evil, as demonic, then the state looks at these folks to try to take them out in order to understand yes. itself as good. Yes. Right. I mean, this is exactly what Patrice Cullors writes in, yes. uh, in, in When They Call You a Terrorist, right? Yep. She shifts her practices, right? Yep. And all of a sudden, we start seeing, I mean, her, her, her brother ends up in jail because of mental health, and she's using these practices to find a way to cope. And yet at the same time, we see that these things constantly get deployed in service of denigrating her, right? That's the thing that is so wild to me. And that's what I was trying to get at with the, with the Theodician element of this, is that the United States will look at Black practices, at Black lives, at Black women's lives. I'm thinking of Sandra Bland here too. Yeah. Black women who are assertive and say, it's your fault that you've ended up dying and we are the one, or you've ended up being prepared because we are the ones who have to be good and we have to be good against something that is evil. Um, and that's what that's how I'm reading that in relation to your work. To, to your work, you can correct me, Margarita, if I'm no, if I'm no, off. Here. And and and, and I, the only other thing I'll add here is that Finley, you know, I, I think of whiteness, which we have to make a distinction between that and the people who are white, though they are connected intimately. So, what whiteness is fundamentally and existentially and phenomenologically is the displacement of the meaning of one's death onto other communities. That's what whiteness is yeah. from a philosophical perspective. It is the displacement of the consideration of one's non-existence onto other folks. That's what it comes down to. And there are a lot of white folks who have found a way to embrace their death. Not, not, not a whole bunch, there are a few who have found a way to do that. But whiteness in general as an existential phenomenological structure is the displacement of that violence, of that death, of that suffering of one's finitude 
on to other communities in order to secure one's comfort. Calvin Warren says this, and actually Christopher Driscoll wrote this in his first book on the um, on um, on white lies. So I think I think we have this structure that's in place that we have to continue. And this for me ends up being a stunted situation to get back to Parsons thing. So I just wanted to add that I'm resonating with everything that's being articulated right now. I, I think uh, Pico, uh, more what I was what I was trying to suggest is this dichotomy for lack of a better term, between good whiteness and bad whiteness. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And, okay. and, uh, and talking, this this idea that you misread, um, uh, what's his name, uh, President, what's, what's the idiot Joe who was Biden. Joe, Joe Biden. Biden. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, and that somehow that's different from the MAGA whiteness. No, yeah. Ex exactly, and I'm saying I don't see it as that kind of dichotomy. I think they both require this, this black object. And I don't even want to say both because I don't want to, it's, it's right. not a dichotomy here. And this is what I mean by white consolidation. When, when these eruptions happen at, at the perception of black progress or desire for progress, some of those distinctions, Republican, Democrat, uh, male, female, gay, straight, go away historically. It's a difficult, it's, and, and, and what I, and only thing I would add here, I think you're right, that there's a difficult, it's difficult to maintain those distinctions because if you notice, particularly in black philosophical discourses, in historical black discourses, in terms of slave narratives, black people rarely use this dichotomy between good, good and bad, unless we're denig unless we're like making a derisive comment about this, right? Well, the house Negro thinks themselves good and that's the problem. What's so fascinating to me about whiteness is that it does make this distinction between the good white person and the bad white person. It is precisely that distinction that displaces the violence onto other communities, right? That's what we fail to realize. If you look at, for example, Joe Biden's speech, we are supposed to be enamored by his claims to support black folks and yet we haven't heard anything by way of prison reform. Many black folks were told to get education, told to go to college, and we are not getting any relief by way of student loan cancellation. Black people are not receiving the COVID vaccine nearly at the rates that white folks are. And so, but we're told that this, this is the good, this is the good one, right? And so, and so it, what, what it ends up being is that the good bad narrative actually produces, it produces a structure of indemnification where white people, the good white person can say, at least I'm not the Klansman. As if, as if the Klansman is the only source of black, of anti-black terror in this country. When, as we all know, all three of us know, King and X both agreed that the moderate and the liberal were some of the most dangerous folks for black folks during the middle of this Worse, world. the worst. Actually. Yes. Thank yes. you, Biko. Yeah. Well, that, that was a great discussion. Um, but I want to get some other questions in when what time we have left. Um, I'll start with a question proposed by Dr. Kripal. And he's proposing this to all three panelists, where he says, I never quite know what to do with these problems with demons, possessions, and strongly negative or palpably terrifying religious experiences. Um, other than to acknowledge that the sacred is morally ambiguous and can right. be a source of fascination or fear. Do you think this fear or terrors always racialized or gendered, always related to white fears of black people? Or is this racializing of magic added to an already ideological fierce attack on magic by an ancient monotheistic theological logic? Or to the phenomenology of a psychological dissolution of the ego, hence the terror, or to some other process or set of processes we do not and cannot yet understand. Or put differently, does the critical race theory explain this phenomenon in toto? If so, what do we do about accusations of witchcraft in Professor Bongba's early work in Africa? What do we do with these demons themselves? Kribal asks. Can I, can I jump, jump? Yeah, I think that's more for you, Margarita. So, I, whoa, that's just such a big question. So there, the middle part of that question, I will answer because I'm very much a both and person. I think it's both and um, that yes, um, witchcraft, you know, whether it's, and I mentioned this briefly in the paper, you know, in the talk is that, you know, these are not just black women practicing witchcraft. I mean, this witchcraft has 
a long lineage. Um, and so the fear it is, is not just upon, just based upon racialization of witchcraft. So I would say yay to that side. But at the same time, when it comes to the racialization of witchcraft, I wanna take it a bit further. So if we look at the historical records of the Salem witchcraft trials in this country, which I have read them, because I'm in Boston, just love having my hands into in primary documents. If you look at the transcriptions of these records, Tituba, who is a slave of color from Barbados, even she becomes the first confessor, right, of, of witchcraft. And even though in this trial, many people will be murdered, okay, found guilty of witchcraft. However, when you go to Salem, which I've been to Salem, none of them, no white men or women who were killed at the hands of, you know, because they practice witchcraft, have a historical marker that suggests that they are the reason why all of this went down. But Tituba has a marker. And her, that, that historical marker not only equates her to the witchcraft movement in the United States, right? But it, it makes her the guilty one. She is the reason why all of these sort of atrocities, she's the reason why all these people were killed. She's the reason why all of this sort of manifested itself. So for me, yes, it can be both and, but when you begin to racialize witchcraft, this takes on a, another dimension. And then I wanna add something else, that in my examples, I'm always really sensitive to flipping both sides of the coin. So one of the examples was a white evangel evangelical man. The first example that um, Hamilton is a black evangelical brother, right? And, and he's sort of espousing this. And, and Atkins is the white ev evangelical man who's sort of picking up on sort of the rhetoric that he starts on YouTube. And then the last one, these are two people who are of African descent, but they're British. The, the bottom line is for me, not only do you have to sort of consider um, sort of intercommunal sort of projections onto black women with respect to sort of demonization through their magical practices, but you also have to sort of turn and look at the ways in which intercommunal sort of responses all sort of also play into the equation. So if you look at the work at, as like Bamba's work and so many that 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 has come, that have come after Bamba, that that you do have intercommunal forms of progression that must uh, of projections that must be also recognized. So it becomes even though I'm trying my best to sort of put sort of these demarcating lines up when it comes at to the relation, the racialization of witchcraft, it becomes a really thick mixed bag. But the bottom line is, and I'm going to keep saying this, there are real consequences. As a black woman, woman living in this body, there are real consequences. These projections manifest themselves in very real ways in the lives of black women who are deemed as demonic sexual deviants, witches. I, I, if, if I can just briefly just share, Margarita, that last piece is so incredibly important. I, I think if you don't mind me just piggybacking off of you real quick, part of the demonization comes from this relationship between black female flesh and affect and specifically black women feeling and feeling free to feel and express themselves. I keep personally, as I'm hearing you and, 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 how, and how you're channeling, and perhaps that's you know all puns intended, how you're channeling colors here. Um, I hear you 
articulating what Sandra Bland said when she was, I, and I, I mean, you talk about the real life and death effects. Sandra Bland is sitting on the side of the road and the officer asks her, hey, are you irritated? And she says, yes, I am, right? And, and, and there's something about this assertiveness, at least in terms of, you know, I'm not an archive person. I don't like do too much primary sources, but there's something to be said about the crawling back through that kind of sort of affective lens that we see with people like Patsy and Solomon North as 12 years a slave, or even someone like, so we see these certain slave narratives that are showing black women being assertive. Uh, in Linda, I mean, if we think about Harriet Jacobs and there's something to be said, I just, I just wanna echo and affirm that this stuff has real life and death effects because what happens is, is the violence, the evil gets displaced on specifically to black female bodies. And I just, just wanted to affirm that that is clearly life and death um, reality. Well, um, I'll try to squeeze in one more question. This one from Dr. Claire Fanger and to shrink her question for sake of time, the crusk that she wants to ask primarily uh, Stephen is reflecting on his proposal of whiteness as a religion or religion of rage. Her question is, is there not a problem in that Freud's view of religion essentially reduces it to a collective neurosis rather than a belief that is a choice? It seems to me that this deserves more straightforward analysis as a kind of pathology of belief, a belief that is a choice. And she goes on to point out the apocalyptic strands of the MAGA movement that takes uh, Christianity and Trumpian rhetoric and creates a new apocalypse for white people. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, my thoughts on that is I'm gonna have to think about that because because I'm not sure to answer that just off the, off the top of my head. Um, I think in some ways I hear what she's saying and she's hearing this, I'll tell her, I'll email her uh, a, a much more detailed answer. Um, it's, it's just something that I'm, that I'm gonna have to think about. I mean, that's, that's really all I, can, all I can say about it, about it right now. I wouldn't say, I mean, go ahead. I, well, I wouldn't I mean, I probably shouldn't. I mean, this was definitely directed towards you, Finley. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I think about this notion of belief as a choice. And phenomenologically, it's just, it's never that cut and dry. Yeah. It, it, it just really never is. Otherwise we would be able to delineate or mark the moment in which Trump rises to prominence and which, in which his supporters, we can't mark that moment. When did it happen? 2015, 2016, 2017? Can we mark the specific moment when people turned and, and went full on like sort of zealots? For, there's no way to mark that. And I think part of that is, is because people are, the, are on the one hand making a decision and on the other hand, making a decision that was presented to them um, by way of their own personal subjective experiences. If someone says all the right things that resonate with you, then you, you have made that choice. But I don't know if that choice was solely yours to have made. Right, and that's what I'm sort of, I mean, I'm not, I don't know the, the work of witchcraft or magic or even the psychoanalytic depths of that, Finley, but I do, I mean, at least from a philosophical perspective, choice is not always, it, it, yeah, belief is not, not ne it's never an easy sort of like distinction and, between. And, and what I think I'm stuck on here is this idea of belief. Right, right. Because um, I'm not sure that I see this, I'm not sure that I see this as, as, as uh, going one way or another on the category of belief, I, I think I think these things are structured, and um, and that's what I'm going to have to think about. But it's that category of belief that I think is causing me the most trouble, because I don't I don't see that see it in that way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a it's an odd. I mean, but belief you know belief is one of those odd categories in the study of religion, and I'm not I'm not because that would be the question, right? Like you know, how do we think about like Trump supporters in relation to him? Like, do they believe in him? Yeah, like, you know what I mean? Like, it's not, it's not cut and dry what that relation is other than something, it's something like fidelity, but I'm not sure 
that fidelity would be the same as a certain kind of belief. And perhaps for me, that comes through, I'm reading this through a sort of Protestant lens here. And that might be why I'm, when I hear belief, I'm thinking Luther, I'm thinking Calvin, I'm thinking, right? You know, I'm not necessarily thinking of other modalities of, of, of thought and belief. That are, that are operative here. And in large part, because as an Americanist, this is what, you know, we, we, when we think belief here in the United States, the literature tells us it's constantly refracted through a Protestant lens. Thank you, that's helpful too. You want me to say something on that? Sure, sure, go ahead. Yes. <laughs> yes. So, uh, you know, when we're dealing with Freud, we're also dealing with his definition of religion. Yes. Within his view of the common man's religion. We're not talking Soren Kierkegaard here. Mm -hmm. not, talking Hillary, not talking Luther, not talking Eckhart or Augustine. We're talking the common man. The common man for Freud, it's almost usually always determined in some sense. So the whole notion of choice and free will begins to go out for Freud, at least. Change up your definition of religion, you might have something different. And that's what I meant by it's structured. Yes, right. So what's interesting about the Trump phenomenon is that the idealization of Trump by his followers is unambiguous. Yes. He no wrong. So that's a very primitive form of idealization. That's narcissism again. And then if you have that, then what you have is a community that is bonded by that idealization. As he said once on TV, I am the chosen one. Well, he was playing to his base because there was all this stuff about him being, you know, the return of Jesus or preparing the return of Jesus. So if you have that and you have a whole community, well, that's tribalism. That's a form of tribalism and it's bonded by this common idealization. The problem with that is that when you then co-op religious concepts like I'm predestined because I'm in this tribal, th this tribe, or that there's gonna be an end of the world and all my enemies are gonna go to hell and we get to go up to heaven, right? That's the apocalypse, that's the end time. So predestination and the apocalypse, these are human inventions. They, they really are not about God and the beyond. They're about, sociologically speaking, the community. Again, this is kind of collective narcissism. And as Freud rightly said in Civilization's Discontents, he talked about the, the narcissism of minor differences. And he, what he's really referring to himself as a Jew, always got, he was part of the out group, love thy neighbor as thyself is his fellow Christian, not his fellow Christians, but the Christians around him said, accept it if you're a Jew. Then you get all the hostility. But he knew that that's that operative everywhere, right? It's operative between the Shia and the Sunni. It's operative between the Protestants and the Catholics, right? And now it's Trump and Trumpers versus the out group. And it's so powerful. Reason is gone. It's completely gone. The, the soul is so disordered in the Augustinian sense. They cannot listen to reason because it's so deep. That's narcissism. Narcissism trumps reason every single time. Pardon the pun. Every single time. And that's why it, this, what you get this return of the repressed. That's why it's always about the now, right? It's hard to change that. It just exists over and over again from decade to decade, century to century. It's a big job we got to do. And quite frankly, I think, you know, one of our only hopes is to have people like you going out and talking to people, right? dialoguing with them, introducing concepts. Maybe that will lead to a change in awareness. Maybe not. Maybe we don't have time. Climate change, right? It's not the Middle Ages. We may not have time for this. So, you know, uh, there's Afro-pessimism and there's just pessimism about the human species. So, uh, and I don't know. I really, I hope for the best, but, and I see you three. And let me just say, since you all did some work with me, how Wonderful it is to see how sophisticated your presentations are. My good Lord, I'm bowled over. I'm bowled over, and that gives me some hope. So thank you for that. Can I, can I just say, I know we're trying to get out of here, and this is my uh, commercial for Rice University, that uh, you know these brilliant presentations m may not have existed were we trained somewhere else with, with other folks. And, um, and this is my commercial for, for Rice University, you know, in the Department of Religious Studies. And uh, because I wouldn't be thinking about religion and race in this way had I not, you know, studied with, you know, Penn and Bamba and, and Kripo and Parsons and so on. And so I appreciate this time. These, these were, were really brilliant presentations. The conversation was fruitful. I learned a lot. I'm thinking a lot. I'll continue to think about these questions. And I just had the uh, uh, 
I just appreciate being here, being able to offer some of these ideas about our contemporary moment uh, and the religion of white rage. And I'm just totally grateful As for, I, for and, Rice. And I'll, and I'll be very brief here. Just want to echo Finley's comments and just simply say that it is one thing to be trained in particular theories. It is another thing to be trained theoretically. And Rice trains you theoretically. It doesn't train you simply to apply certain certain theories to specific realities. It trains you to recognize where your strengths and weaknesses are, what lenses are, are useful and fruitful for particular realities. And this conversation has just illuminated so much of that. And so I'm so thankful to you, you Dr. Parsons, to my teachers who are still on the call, to Elias and Jeff and Mickey. Um, like I'm, I'm just so thankful to that kind of training that happens. It just so happens that I ended up becoming a philosopher. It just so happens that you know that Finley ended up becoming a, a historian of religions and psychoanalytic person. It just so happens that Margarita became a social scientific, social theoretical uh, theorist of religion. But we would not have been able to do that or be able to articulate the distinctions between our work had we not been able to come here and think through these things. So thank you all for bringing us here. I'm saying this more for the recording in perpetuity for people who will look at it later. Thank you, Peter. And to let the audience know, Dr. Uh, Guillory had a prior um, engagement and had to leave early, but she also expresses her gratitude for being able to speak here to us and be part of this wonderful panel. So thank you everyone for being here today. Thank you, Dr. Stephen Finley. Thank you, Dr. Biko Gray. And of course, Dr. Margarita Guillory for your wonderful presentations and your insightful and thought and provoking um, perspectives. So thank you very much. Thank you.